Hello and welcome to Knife Chats, a channel where we discuss the history of cutlery as well as offer reviews on affordably priced knives for the user and collector alike. Without further ado, let's see what today's video is about. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about this, the M5 bayonet. It's got a kind of an interesting niche in uh, US military bayonets. Um, for a number of reasons and I uh, just thought I'd give a little chit chat about it. Um, as you can tell it looks very much like uh, the bayonet you found on the M16 rifle, the M7 bayonet and that's because they all have the same heritage. They all trace their roots back to the uh, M3 trench knife. However, um, this was not a replacement for the M3 trench knife. It was a replacement for the M1 bayonet, which was designed for the M1 rifle. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. And as you can tell, there's a noticeable difference between these two bayonets. Principally, the length of the blade. One is a six and three quarter inch blade. The other one's about a 10 inch blade. Now, the M1 bayonet was really the last of the long bayonets used by the uh, U.S. Army and this was, or U.S. military, and this was actually uh, a short bayonet uh, for the time. Um, this started being used in 1943 or so, and it was a replacement for the M1942 and the M1905 bayonets, which uh, well, the M1905 bayonet uh, goes all the way back to World War I and was still being used in World War II. And it was one of those sword bayonets and they basically cut it down and created the M1 bayonet. And they changed the nomenclature at that time. It was originally an M1942 and then an M1 bayonet. And so you had the M1 bayonet, the M1 Garand, and the M1 carbine. And um, then uh, the M3 trench knife became a bayonet also and you, that we really need another M1 with a M1 carbine, M1 rifle, M1 bayonet, no. So instead they took the M3 trench knife and they made the M4 bayonet out of it. And this was the first bayonet to feature the six and three quarter inch blade, but it was for a carbine. But they learned a lot from this because they realized that uh, for the most part, that six and three quarter inch blade um, was doing what it needed to do at the end of a bayonet in most cases. Uh, obviously, when uh, pairing against the sword bayonets being used by the Japanese, it wasn't too, uh, too uh, helpful. So uh, they still like those long sword blade bayonets in the Pacific theater. But uh, shorter bayonets like the 10 inch bayonet were doing fine in World War II. So after World War II, they started thinking, well, we need to come up with a new bayonet for the M1 rifle. And uh, they really started looking for a new bayonet around the time of the Korean War. Now, a lot of people think that this bayonet was used in the Korean War, but not really. This uh, bayonet became uh, accepted for uh, production right at the end of the Korean War and with the exception of the T10 prototypes, no M5 bayonet actually uh, saw service in the Korean War, uh, at least during the uh, before the ceasefire. They started showing up after the ceasefire, uh, near the end of, uh, of uh, 1953, beginning of 1954, so after hostilities had ended. Uh, it's unique in many ways, but one of the cool things is this little stud here, which actually fits into the gas port of the M1 rifle. And that's really what makes it different than almost any other bayonet in U.S. military service, because all the other ones have a bayonet ring. So it's easy to notice this one compared to the other ones. One of the things that the Korean War taught the United States, though, was the need for a better latch on their bayonet so that they could actually close it uh, wearing heavy gloves. And that's why this latch is so big. That was something that they got out of the Korean War, the need for this really big heavy latch, which you can work even with gloves. Um, the other thing that you'll notice with this bayonet 
is, uh, well, here's the M4 bayonet, M8A1 sheath. Fits perfectly, and because you've got the same blade, still fits perfectly. And this continued all the way through the M6 bayonet for the M14 carbine, and the M7 bayonet for the M16 carbine, or M16 rifle. M14 carbine. M14 rifle had the M6 bayonet. M16 rifle had the M7 bayonet. Um, but they all used the same M8A1 sheath. And these actually date from the end of World War II um, when uh, they decided that the leather sheaths were just not working, especially in the Pacific. They would just rot and mildew and everything. So they came out with the, the plastic sheath with the metal throats. A lot of people think that these sheaths are these scabbards actually sharpen the blades. And not at all. There's no sharpening mechanism in here. All it does is scrape the, uh, the metal on either side because it will hold them in there even though you do have the catch on top. So that's the M5 bayonet. This particular one is an M5-1 that was made by uh, J&D Tool Company. Four people made the, uh, or four companies made the M5 bayonets. They're all actually either M5A1 or M5-1. Uh, J&D Tool made the M5-1 along with Ariel and the M5A1s were made by Imperial and Utica. Is that right? I believe so. Ba -da 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 -da. Yeah, Imperial and Utica made the M5A1s. Imperial actually came up with the design. They held the patent for it. And so they made the first, the M5A1s. They also produced the T10 prototypes that were tested in the Korean War. However, you will not find a blade, an M5 stamped knife that saw service during the Korean War. They just weren't used during that time. They came out right after the war and they stayed in service until about 1959 when the M14 started coming out. What's really interesting though is a lot of uh, reserve units and even some of the Marine units um, went straight from the uh, M19 I'm sorry, the M1 bayonet right into an M6 bayonet and never saw the M5 bayonet showing up in their units simply because uh, it, it just wasn't necessary. Uh, they went right from the older M1 bayonets right into the M6 bayonets for the M14s when they swapped off weapons. Um, just uh, one of those odd little tidbits that people uh, probably aren't aware of. In any case, I'll have a little slideshow afterwards uh, that will show some better pictures of this and a little more factoids about the M5 bayonet. So stay tuned for that. You may have noticed that I was mainly talking about the M5A1 or M5-1 bayonet and talked very little about the M5 bayonet. They're, they're both usually just called the M5 bayonet, uh, but in reality, the M5 bayonet was not adopted. Um, there were issues with it and there were minor changes made before it was actually adopted into military service. And when it was adopted after these uh, minor modifications, it became the M5A1 or the M5-1, depending on who made them. And there's really no difference between an M5A1 and an M5-1. So here we have the bayonet with the M8A1 scabbard. Now the uh, scabbard, the M8A1, came out in 1944, and it replaced the earlier M8 scabbard, which came out in 1943. So the uh, M8 scabbard was only around for less than a year, actually. And the main difference between the two is the uh, permanently attached frog was extended a little bit, and they added this wire hanger, which is used to attach the... Uh, the knife to the cartridge belt. Before that, the uh, the cartridge belt was slipped through the uh, the webbing here, and the soldiers were complaining because it was taking up space on their belt. Um, and by using this hanger, they were able to basically dangle it from the bottom of the belt 
and uh, so it allowed them to carry more equipment. Also, this allowed them to attach it to backpacks and other things. So uh, it was uh, really a one of those things that these soldiers pushed for and got pretty quickly. And so th this was the uh, scabbard that was first issued with the M4 bayonets. A few M4 bayonets also had the M8 scabbards. And actually, the earliest M8A1 scabbards are also just stamped M8 because, uh, well, they were in transition moving from one to the other. And here we see both the M1 bayonet and the M5 bayonet. And you will notice the longer 10 inch blade versus the uh, six and three quarter inch blade. Um, and uh, also you see the two different scabbards and the, the style of the scabbards. One of the good features of both bayonets is the fact that they are spear point blades, which, uh, and because of the way that uh, the scabbards are designed, you can uh, basically carry these left or right-handed. Uh, the blade will fit in just fine either way. Um, the latch for catching the M1 bayonet is actually on the scabbard in the little hook right there. Uh, as you can tell, you just got a strap here and uh, friction holding in the uh, M5 bayonets. Up here you see this uh, little round button or plug that goes into the uh, gas port on the M1 rifle. And this is felt to be an advantage over a barrel ring because it made it easier to attach and uh, detach the uh, bayonet from the M1 rifle. And below here you see the release. This is one of the things that was modified on the uh, original M5 bayonets. Uh, they made it larger so that you would be able to remove the uh, the bayonet while wearing heavy mittens and so this release is one of the things that makes it a different uh, that changed the M5 into the M5A1 and like I mentioned uh, what few M5s that were uh, actually um, issued were basically recalled and then modified into an M5A1. This basically just shows you the difference between the little stud used on the M5-1 versus the barrel ring used on the uh, uh, M7 bayonet uh, for the M16 rifle. And here's one of the markings you'll see on the uh, blade side of the guard. It'll say US M5-1 if it's made by um, Ariel or Jones and Dickinson. If it's made by Utica or Imperial, it'll say US M5A1. There were also some um, M5 bayonets made in Korea, and in which case, instead of saying US, they will simply have a K over here. And on the opposite side of the blade, you see it say J&D Tool Company. This is for Jones and Dickinson. It could also say, uh, uh, Utica or Ariel or Imperial, depending on what other company was making it. Like I mentioned, M5-1 is for J&D or Ariel. I'm not sure what is stamped on the other side if the knife is made in Korea. I chose to display my uh, M5 bayonet hanging off of the uh, M1956 uh, entrenching tool cover. Um, obviously adopted in 1956 and used all through uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, I also want to make a slight clarification. While the M14 was adopted in 1959, it actually uh, entered U.S. Army service in 1961 and then entered service with the uh, Marine Corps in 1965. So the uh, the M5 bayonets were being used, uh, at least in the active units, uh, up until 1961 in the Army and in some Marine Corps units until 1965. However, like I mentioned, some units did swap straight from the M1 bayonet to the M6 bayonet when they uh, went, moved on to the M14 rifles. As for this particular M5-1 bayonet, it was issued to my father-in-law when he was a Marine back in 1957 and stationed in Hawaii. Um, 
and uh, it's in relatively great shape, uh, especially for a knife that's as old as I am. Um, the M8A1 scabbard also came with the knife, and uh, I'm very happy to have it. Uh, if you have any insights into the M5 bayonet that uh, hasn't already been mentioned in this uh, video, please uh, share them with me in the comment section and I will get back to you. Thanks for visiting. If you like this video, please share it with a friend and consider subscribing to Knife Chats. To be notified of future episodes, don't forget to ring that bell. As always, your comments are welcome and insults are cheerfully ignored. Remember, you're only as sharp as your knife.